our first one, we know. But the women, I loved learning about the women, and I went over that last week, and I won't go into it much this week, but um, Saints Phil uh, Philanella, uh, Zeneda, and Hermione, mothers of the church, physicians of the church, and the reason that I mentioned them, um, they had the concept of whole person. Body, soul, um, with the spirit brings about healing. And that's what I experienced in my own life, so my own story is a testament to the foundation of the church, the scripture, and what Jesus did for us. And this season where we uh, are moving toward resurrection, he wants to bring resurrection in all of our lives, and he did that for me. So uh, the, the unmercenary physicians, and I uh, mentioned that with that book that I brought last week, was by Archbishop Lazar, abbot of the Canadian Orthodox Monastery of All Saints of North America. And he'd done quite a bit of study into uh, the first women physicians of the church and how they brought it all together, the whole person, the body, and the soul. So I'm going to speed on through. Well, I should tell you, though, they had good pedigrees. Zeneda and Filanello were cousins of St. Paul and sisters of uh, Bishop Jason. And uh, Hermenea, or Hermione, <laughs> um, I had to look that one up, and I almost, I almost forgot. Uh, daughter of Deacon Philip from Acts 6. Famous women, but we haven't heard much about them. But redemption, healing, it's whole person, salvation means healing. And that's what Christ has bought for us, and that's what he wants to do for us during this time as we prepare for Resurrection Day. But he doesn't heal just one part, and that's my story. He didn't heal just one part of me. He healed the whole person, body and soul. And Isaiah 61, one to three, I'm not standing in front of that, is the scripture that I go back to, I've gone back to for years and years, that he came to heal the brokenhearted, to bring freedom to the captives, to release us from dark prisons of our soul and our body and to comfort those who mourn and to give us a crown of beauty instead of ashes, instead of mourning a garment of praise, instead of a spirit of despair. So this is my story a long, long time ago on the 4th of July. Pause. We've got one more coming. Out of all of these, we'll get one for sure. I'll just do yours, honey. <laughs> okay, go ahead. It was the 4th of July, many, many, many years ago, and I was house sitting for some friends of our family. It was 3 in the morning, and I woke up cold. We were near the ocean, um, and it gets cold at night. I wonder why I'm so cold. And the door, I looked up and the door to the patio was open. So I thought, I'm going to get up and, and get that close. And I rolled over and I saw a young man crouched in the corner of my room. It was not my room, I was house sitting, but the room I was staying in. And instead of getting up and running out, because the door was open and he could have run straight out, he jumped up, ran over, pulled out a pipe from his pants and said, now you're dead. And he proceeded to do his best to kill me. Uh, pardon me, but I have allergies. It's allergy season. So I may have to keep drinking water. So he ran over and began beating me over the head with this pipe. And it was a pipe that young people I learned from the detective use to smoke dope. It has a little, it's a piece of plumbing from under the sink. has a little bowl at the end. And that's what he used to begin beating me over the head. And he kept yelling, now you're dead. So he told me his goal was to kill me. And uh, eventually, uh, the pipe flew out of our hands. I rolled off the bed onto the floor. And that's when um, he choked me. And uh, I left my body. I felt my spirit kind of pop out. And it seemed like it was traveling very, very quickly through a very black area that was comforting. I saw some little lights that seemed to be twinkling in the distance. And um, all of a sudden, I was back in my body, but not where I left it. I was outside 
at the end of the dog run, hanging on the fence with my arms and screaming for help. So begins the story of what God did for me through all of this. So it seemed that, you know, things happen fast. It seemed like a short period of time, and yet it seemed like an eternity that I went through all of that. So now I'm going to unpack the story and tell you what happened, my injuries, and what God did for me. So the scripture that I love, he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, punished, that brought us peace, uh, the peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. There I was. That was me a couple days after the attack. I had no whites hardly in my eyes. Part of my scalp had torn off, been torn off at the top of my head. The detective found it in the bedroom laying by the door where I had fallen. I had a scar down, you can see it, down the side of my face. All of this is a testament to the healing. It's obviously there no more. Um, none of the effects of the injuries are seen today. But um, my worst injury was to my right hand because I had put it up on the top of my head to protect myself, um, not even realizing it was there. And when I got to the hospital, <clears throat> my ring finger was hanging by a tiny little piece of skin. Thanks be to God, it was still there because they were able to attach it. But I, um, my hand was split open, deep down inside. I could look inside my hand and see deep inside. And these two knuckles were gone. Here they are. I'll tell you about that in a, in a little bit. They were gone. They were reduced to powder and bone fragments. So I had no knuckles. It just so happened um, that the uh, top hand surgeon of Orange County, California, was there at the hospital. Excuse me, I have to, pardon me, I have to just keep drinking water. It's, the, it's allergy season, right? <clears throat> the top hand surgeon of Orange County was there, just happened to be in the hospital, and worked on my hand. He worked on it for hours, came back and said, you'll never use your hand again. It's so destroyed. Um, you'll be handicapped for the rest of your life. And I was alive, but I didn't feel very alive. So I'm gonna show you, this is what I looked like before the attack. I had been Miss Tacoma, and uh, now I look pretty bad. So I look like that. So I'll go back to the scripture. I wanna tell you what a miracle that night was. The detective found the drawer for the desk, I was in one of the um, young men, uh, they had two teenagers in one of the boys' rooms, and he had a desk in there, and I had fallen not far from that desk onto the floor. And the detective found bloody fingerprints that had crawled across the desk drawer and stopped centimeters before a hunting knife. Had he grabbed that hunting knife, I would not. That's how close I got to not being here. But I was pretty close to not being here anyway. So that I want to talk about next. What in the world happened? The mystery. If I were writing a book, and I haven't, I've put this story in abbreviated form in most of my books, but if I were writing a book just about this, this would be chapter two or three, The Mystery. He rescues us from great danger of death, and he continues to rescue us, rescue us to this day. 2 Corinthians 1.10. Move over. Like that. I was in the way. So where does God want to bring life to you? Where does he want to rescue you? I, I don't want this just to be about me. So... I want to bring you in. Where does he want to rescue you? So here's the crime scene. You can't see too well, but there's um, a bloody spot on the door there, and there's the, the detective took this of, of different parts of the room. Where I, that's where I had fallen, by the door. 
where I left my body was there on the floor by the door. And the detective said to me, okay, so we found a puddle of blood by the door. We found part of your scalp. We found blood, a puddle of blood out by the fence and at the end of the dog run. And there was the house. And how, he said, did you get out of the room all the way across the patio and all the way down that dog run with no blood drops at all because head wounds bleed very profusely. How did, how did you get there? <laughs> I have no idea. I don't even know how I got back in my body. <laughs> I was on my way home. And I had said at that moment, Father, receive me into your hands. I knew, I knew this was the end. I knew I was leaving. I was not coming back. So it was quite a while, it was years, that, that puzzled me. How did I get there? What did happen? What went on that night? I have no idea. But one night I had a dream, and in my dream, I saw Jesus walk into the room and pick up a lifeless body and do CPR. He blew across my nose and mouth, and it was his breath of life. Donna did this picture for me, which is on my PowerPoints. The miracle. I told this story on Sid Roth's show, and he said, well, when I told him that dream, he said, that sounds good enough for me. <laughs> it's the only explanation I have, but it sounds good enough for me. He care I saw him in my dream carry me outside and prop me up at the end of the dog run, where a neighbor heard me screaming. Actually, it was a neighbor whose son was involved in the whole deal that night, not the one who attacked me. He was in another part of the house stealing booze and drugs, uh, not drugs, booze and money. And this was a nice family in Orange County. So, a miracle. That was a miracle. That I was still alive was a miracle. But heal, well, I want to go back. I'll, I'll keep the slide up for healing of my soul, but I want to go back to my hand because here's the second miracle. Months after um, the attack, I had gone to see the um, hand surgeon, and he said, you know, your hand is in such bad shape, I can't even go in and put in plastic knuckles. You, um, you're just really, really in bad shape. Well, I could see I was in bad shape. I had this weird little um, cast that they built they, they had to build it. It was, it was very, very weird. I looked very weird. I looked like I was from outer space during those strange months of my life. But they had to build and mold this thing, and then it had a little arm, or a stand and a round circle, and these fingers hung by a rubber band, but it was removable, and so I could take it off. And when I would take it off, this was the ugliest hand I'd ever seen in my life. It didn't even look like a hand. It looked like a big blob. It would shake. Um, I would have to put it back in the cast right away. Uh, there was no hope. I would go to um, physical therapy and just trying to move my finger about a quarter of an inch. I, the pain was so great, uh, I would feel like I was going to lose my lunch. So I was getting nowhere, absolutely nowhere. And I went home that day from the doctor's office, and I was very, very discouraged when he said, you, you know, there's nothing we can do for you. I don't know what to do. It looks like you're going to be like this for the rest of your life. And I remembered the scripture. You know, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, and my heart was really, really sick. And I said, you know, Lord, um, if I'm to be handicapped, if that's part of your plan, I'll accept it. I sure don't want that. But if healing is a part of your plan for me, I would love to know <clears throat> if that's what you plan to do. But I just can't live in this unknowing. Uh, it just it, It's so difficult. Would you just talk to me in some way about this? Just speak to me. What do you want to do? What is your plan for me? By the next morning, I was awakened to an audible voice in my room. The sweetest voice I've ever heard said, Sherry, I want you to look at your hand. And 
my cast was off and I was doing this. I had only, I could barely even do this before. And my hand was moving as though nothing had ever happened to it. And she said audibly, I, I call this an angel, it had to be an angel, a messenger from God. And she said, you are going to go back to where you were before this moment, but you will get better and better and better and better until one day your hand will be completely whole. And you will write all those books you were told in a dream. I was told in a dream that I would write so many books I would forget how many I'd written. <laughs> that hasn't happened yet, so there must be some more. I've written 35 books. <laughs> there must be more on their way, because I haven't forgotten. But uh, that's at the time when this happened, I had not <clears throat> written one book. And it seemed utterly impossible. But when the angel, I'm going to call it an angel, said that to me, I had more hope than I'd had since the moment of the attack that something was going to happen, and it certainly did. And I did get better and better and better every single day <clears throat> until I went back to the doctor and said, I took the cast up and said, look at this. And here's this guy whose his jaw drops open, and he says, you know, I don't believe in miracles, but you're about the closest thing I've ever seen to one my life. And I said, this is all to God's glory. He healed me. <laughs> he didn't say another word. To God be all the glory. Amen. And I've told this story, I've told my story so many places because I've said, God, I want to bring you glory through this. This is such a hideous thing that happened. Although much worse things have happened to other people. I don't I don't want to ever claim that I've had the worst stuff happen because there have been horrible things that happen to people. But wherever I tell my story, I always say I only tell this to give you hope that God can do anything, no matter what, no matter what we face, God can do anything. So I'm moving on now to the part about the soul. Where does your soul need healing? Where did my soul need healing? I needed a lot of healing, not just in body, but in soul. Oops, I want to go back. What I discovered through that whole event, and I've heard many people say this now, the emotional pain of that event hooked up to a lot of emotional pain from the past. It kind of was like a big tsunami that rolled into my soul, where I felt like I could hardly breathe, like I could hardly function in life. And I realized, uh, I had enough uh, wherewithal to realize, this, is hooked, this isn't just this moment, but it's hooked up with a lot of stuff from the past. My mother, who died when I was six years old of breast cancer. Um, my grandfather lived with my maternal grandparents. And Grandpa John died when I was nine. And, and my father had a tragedy when I was 13, terrible tragedy. And on it went. There were a lot of tragedies in our family and a lot of things that happened. But you know, many times it isn't just the large things, the big things that happen. It can be the small things, too. And it all builds up and adds up. and and uh, one pain connects to another, and, and suddenly we're overwhelmed with emotional issues. And that's when God began to heal my soul as I cried out for healing of soul as well as healing of body. And I met three lovely Lutheran ladies. I called them my kitchen angels who prayed for me around the kitchen table as I began to cry my tears and purge my soul through what was it mostly? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Father John talked about that a couple Sundays ago. It's so, so important, the forgiveness of, of, of even myself. Even that night of being in that house, my, my best friend had said to me, Sherry, I don't think you're supposed to go back there tonight. I, I don't have a good feeling about this. Being young, I was very young, single. Oh, I'll be fine. Nothing will happen.